forum on the uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Uh, but I want to first uh, thank uh, Dee Bowling, uh, who is the Senior Director of Communications at the Tulane School of uh, Public Health and Public Medicine, and uh, Rob Magoo and all of the uh, IT and all the visual group that has helping us with uh, that support. Uh, we have a uh, panel of uh, discussants uh, that come from across the university. Maybe I spoke too slow. Uh, includes uh, from individuals from across the university as well as even uh, from uh, outside the university, from the medical center, uh, myself, uh, Ryan Blanton, uh, Preston Marks from uh, the, in the Department of uh, Tropical Medicine and also at the uh, Primate Center, uh, David Mushoff uh, at uh, the School of uh, Medicine, uh, Michael Reedy from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Lena Moses who is joining us uh, from Geneva who is in the uh, School of Public Health. Uh, and the Department of Community Health. Uh, Anna Gerard uh, at the uh, Tulane um, uh, Medical Center. And uh, Angela Birnbaum from uh, the uh, Tulane uh, National Climate <coughs> Research Center. Uh, and finally, uh, Meredith Spears, uh, who comes to us from the uh, Uptown Campus Center of the University. Um, we, uh, uh, I am uh, Ronald Blanton. Um, I'm the chair of the Department of Tropical Medicine. I have uh, 30 years of experience uh, working in mostly population-based studies in Brazil, Kenya, and Egypt, and uh, mainly have worked in the molecular biology of schistosomes, dengue, and uh, antimicrobial resistance. Um, we have an opportunity uh, with uh, this epidemic and other epidemics, actually, to uh, show uh, that it is appropriate to bring these kind of questions into the school of uh, public health even though uh, and nowadays, at least in public health and epidemiology in general, uh, the meat and potatoes is really uh, has to do with chronic diseases, uh, cancer, uh, heart disease, uh, hypertension, even violence. Um, so, uh, but when you think of the bread and butter of uh, public health and of epidemiology, it really comes back to uh, the epidemiology of infections and uh, epidemic diseases, where this discipline started where epidemiology really started in these areas. And in addition to that, uh, there's something special about infections, the idea of contagion, uh, that uh, your friends and your neighbors and your family uh, can transmit some dangerous uh, biological agent between you. These two people in the front row may transmit some dangerous biological agent between them. Uh, that has a, a special grip on the human psyche that really isn't duplicated by almost any other form of disease. So that uh, I think it is appropriate and it, uh, to garner that kind of interest. If you look at most of the, the discussions of, uh, of uh, the economy uh, for various reasons, uh, the coronavirus epidemic is always part of that discussion. And the regions of epidemics are much further than just mere individual human suffering. This is a, uh, a website that I find extremely useful. It's updated uh, several times a day from uh, John Hopkins. Uh, Center for System Science and Engineering. Uh, it shows most of the information that you're interested in on one page uh, with uh, the, the total number of uh, infections. It can be broken down by a country and even by cities within that country. It shows the number of deaths. There's an epidemiologic curve. This little divot here is because uh, China has changed its uh, reporting to include uh, what is not entirely laboratory for some cases, but the symptomatic cases. Um, but in any case, uh, the WHO seems not to have followed that. Uh, and it also shows a map, uh, which you can zoom in and out of, give a much higher resolution than I've given here. But I like actually this view, uh, because it looks at the entire globe and gives you an idea of the risk. One of the things that's unusual about this, this map uh, is how much it appears to be confined uh, to China. There are really only a smattering of cases uh, if you compare it to China. 
outside of China. Uh, and if you look at the uh, epidemiologic curve, uh, this is uh, all of the Chinese cases, and these cases in yellow are the cases outside of China, which uh, is actually um, uh, gives you a false sense of security. If you look at uh, the rate of increase, uh, both in China, or compare the total to the rate outside of China, it really parallels very well this increase, uh, both outside China as well as inside China. And what that presages is that the risk of pandemic is still great out there. There are lots of countries that have reported no cases. Uh, all of South America and all of Africa until now have no confirmed cases of this disease. Uh, but if this is a seasonal disease, to coin a phrase, winter is coming to the southern end. And we may actually see an increase in uh, blossoming. Even if this uh, epidemic decreases in China, the rest of the world remains uh, uh, a risk at any time. I don't mean to minimize this, however, uh, the, the risk and the suffering and the economic uh, impact of all of this uh, on the world and on individuals. But I think we all need to take a step back and realize we've seen this before. Epidemics have happened throughout human history, and epidemics are part of what happens to people when they live in large groups, which is what humans do. Many of our latest epidemics, although you can point to one cause or another cause, ultimately come down to humans being human, to doing what we normally do, uh, that we, we do chop down trees, uh, we do play outside. Uh, and those things bring us into contact with nature and perhaps more than ever uh, into contact with nature. But it is not nature that has changed, but we have changed. Uh, evolution still happens and there are still new organisms that occur, uh, as well as <coughs> uh, um, um, new organisms occur and uh, people will come in contact with those organisms. I also don't want you to think that this is a problem of Africa or Asia. There are hundreds, maybe thousands, of viruses in the Amazon basin, many of which can infect human cell lines and therefore have the potential to jump the species barrier. And be not proud, uh, the 1918 epidemic, there is evidence that it may have started here. The 2009 pandemic, there is evidence that it may have started here. And how many of you have heard of Bourbon? Oh, come on. There's many more people there that have heard of Bourbon. I think in this crowd, there are way too many people that have heard of Bourbon. But I'm talking about the, the disease. There is a virus called Bourbon, and now called the Midwestern disease, the Midwestern virus, that only occurs, as you might guess, in the Midwest. It only occurs here. So this is not a problem of one particular place, or even one particular time. It is part of the human condition. There will be epidemics. Uh, and for that reason, one of the first things that we all would like to do is to point out uh, that there should not be stigmatization associated with this, since this is, as I stated, part of the human condition. So, if you feel like having Chinese food or Japanese food going out to a Korean restaurant or Vietnamese, Vietnamese restaurant steal the plate, you do so. And uh, if you're paying, take me with you. <laughs> but um, now you know. Uh, that uh, this is a problem that we're trying to avoid. That is, uh, that people are stigmatized because of where this disease originated. We should start at the beginning, and the beginning would be starting with uh, the origin of this virus, and I, I can't think of anybody better uh, to do that uh, than uh, Preston Marks. Uh, professor Marks is uh, a professor <laughs> in the uh, Department of Tropical Medicine. He has also worked at uh, the Primate Center. Uh, he is one of the principal people uh, to uh, uh, run down the origins of the HIV epidemic from its origins in SIV in Africa uh, to today. And uh, his work is primarily uh, focused on the pathogenesis of uh, HIV in a non-human climate. Uh, question. Call it game. You know, deer, squirrel, possum, raccoon, and alligator. Just to name five. So it's not anything that's special to China. So the joy. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm going to give a very brief overview of the coronavirus family. I can see it here. Uh, and because first start with the name. I'm sure you've sort of sort that move. That should be pointing to 
these spikes right here that look a little bit like a crown, hence the name coronavirus, uh, when they were discovered not, not that long ago, maybe 30 years ago. And uh, so uh, this, uh, uh, this family is known for a high rate of uh, recombination and formation of hybrid viruses, which may be why we're all here, because uh, the new coronavirus may be a hybrid. The SARS virus was a hybrid, and I'll show you that, and maybe we'll follow the same, uh, propose the same scenario for the, the, the new virus. And as many hosts, uh, it's primarily a bat virus. It's been in humans, obviously. Civets, that's uh, probably the intermediate host that was involved in SARS. Camel and mares, and it's a very serious disease. That's in, uh, primarily in Saudi Arabia. Bat virus to camel, camel to human. Uh, and then others, you can see even songbirds and whales and everything else. Uh, we got new human coronaviruses in uh, 2003 when SARS appeared. Mares came in, that's Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, came in 2012, and COVID, of course, late last year. <coughs> so the mouse hepatitis virus is a coronavirus, and that's what's used in laboratories to work out the replication and, and so on and so forth. So there's a diagram of the virus. Uh, it's an RNA virus, <coughs> and it has an RNA genome, and uh, it's the largest RNA genome of all the viruses that are known. Uh, it encodes in 25 to 30 proteins, so it's a, it's a big target for the immune system. Uh, and uh, the, um, that's a really a large number of proteins for an RNA virus. The DNA virus is a larger, but certainly that. Uh, pay close attention to the spike protein. It's called the S team, S for spike or maybe surface. And uh, I've got it marked here. And that is the uh, attachment site where the virus attaches to a susceptible cell and initiates infection. And uh, that's gonna be the target of protective antibody. Uh, if one has antibody against these spikes, one will almost certainly be protected from infection because the virus can't get inside the cell. Um, it's broken up, the group is broken up into four, the alpha coronavirus, which includes the common cold virus, uh, one of the common cold virus, uh, well, several, I should say. Uh, the numbers I read, about 25% of human colds are, uh, are from the, uh, uh, the alpha coronaviruses. The beta is where this group is, the COVID, theirs, and SARS. I should say there are also bat viruses in these other groups. Gamma, poultry, and even little songbirds um, for the delta group. Um, yeah, since um, uh, a vaccine is certainly, at least theoretically possible, and they're certainly underdeveloped. There's a number of uh, companies that are claiming to have already tested in animals and are ready to move to clinical trials uh, during the summer. So hopefully we'll see, we will see a vaccine. <coughs> so just some of the characteristics of, of the virus, uh, it's about 30 different species. I think there's many, many more. This virus is, in, is everywhere. Uh, and of course, we talked about the propensity to form hybrids. Animal reservoirs that exist, certainly the natural host is almost certainly bats, and it's infecting intermediate hosts, thus exposing animals and humans for emerging. So hybrid viruses uh, can get a capacity to expand their host range, and that may be what the mechanism is uh, behind the emergence uh, the past 17 years of three viruses. Uh, it's 88% identity, genetic identity to the horseshoe bat, which is an old world species <coughs> Uh, of bats, and uh, uh, but only 68% in the S gene, the spike gene. That would suggest that's a recombinant. That that the virus acquired other information uh, from another species, probably another bat, and is uh, a possibly a hybrid virus. Um, there has been in in, uh, uh, in a province right next to uh, Hubei, uh, there was horseshoe bats were tested, and 13 to 66% were infected, that's a big number. Uh, so apparently the virus is quite common in its natural host, um, which is um, why it can obviously spread. I know you can't see this, but I've color coded for you. And uh, the way up here is SARS, and in red, and the black would be bat viruses. And uh, here's red for the COVID, and black for the, uh, the bat virus is there. And that's, that's the point. The point is here that uh, the tree of the, 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 uh, the SARS-like uh, viruses, well, in fact, all of the, uh, all the coronaviruses, that these viruses cluster together and cluster with bats. Uh, if you put the, uh, the civet, it would, it's not in this tree, but it would be up there somewhere. 
because the civet is obviously a member, they're known to be a member of this group. Um, what else do I want to say here? So here's Coke, down here's the mayor, so it's in a different group. Here's the horseshoe bass, or here. And uh, the important part here uh, is this 100% tree order right here, which shows that uh, the COVID virus is clustering with the horseshoe bats and not in the other place. Uh, <coughs> so this is the range of horseshoe bats. Uh, I counted 13 species, and there's a real cluster around the Mediterranean and the Middle East, so maybe there's some potential there for crossover and keep an eye on it. And of course, here's South China, where there's some five or six species coming together, and that would be fertile ground for the virus to exchange segments and gain new capacity and, uh, as a hybrid. So what about the SARS virus? So since this is a member of the same, it's, 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 they could have called it SARS type two, but, uh, but since this is a member of the SARS group, uh, let it be instructive to go back to see how SARS emerged. And based on sequencing and sequencing of bat viruses, there were two genes, the S gene and the ORF8, which is another gene of the virus, way this would happen is these two horseshoe bats of different species would be roosting in the same cave and co-infect another bat of the horseshoe bat species. There have to be a third species. It could be one of these two. And both the viruses are growing in this contact bat. And uh, if two viruses infect the same cell, they can exchange genetic material, recombination, a kind of viral sex when you exchange uh, genetic information. And, uh, and then that produces a hybrid, which is a <coughs> double recombinant, has a, a, a new portion of the spike, and then this ORF8, which then is supposed to infect the civet and certainly that's being borne out by sequencing data and then passed to humans. So is that the way we got the new COVID virus? Uh, and so I would, this, this, this is all speculation, but it may be that uh, one horseshoe bat species number one, horseshoe bat species number two, co-infected another bat, uh, and then that bat got a hybrid between one and two. And uh, so, and it's probably gonna be in the G. The G protein is right around there. And that would give it some new capacity to bind new cells and perhaps broaden its host range to other animals and, and human beings. Uh, so did the new hybrid virus have an expanded host range? And then that's just a summary, which if you look at it, I'm not gonna read it to you. But that's a brief overview, I hope that's helpful. Then get through the rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, just to emphasize uh, here that what we hope to do is just to give you uh, a framework, to fill in some blanks and put a whole lot of things together that will allow you to maybe attach uh, the deluge of information that you're going to get, put it into context given the, the things that we talked about and that you've heard here today. And perhaps uh, counteract if there is a lot of uh, false information out there, we may be able to counteract some of that. One of the important key things that most people want to know about uh, any disease is what is the disease, what does it look like? And uh, for that, uh, I have asked uh, David Musha, David, we gotta get another picture. Um, the second chief <laughs> in, uh, in uh, internal medicine at the School of Medicine. Uh, he is a PI of the Louisiana uh, AIDS Research Program and has special interest in HIV medicine, uh, fungal and micro mycobacterial <coughs> orthopedic infection, and zoonosis. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me to participate in this wonderful symposium. All right, so I'm going to. I actually had about 30 slides that I made last weekend, but Dr. Bland asked me to come way down, so this is gonna be very short and sweet. So I'm gonna focus on the clinical presentation. We'll talk a little bit about treatment, transmissibility, which everybody I think is interested in, and I'll show you some websites, my favorite websites. So I wanna start with this classic surveillance pyramid. This is a, a model for most viruses and how they behave and how they present clinically. And what's really important here is that many viruses, perhaps most, when they get in the population, the majority of people have mild or, or asymptomatic infections, and a smaller number will have severe, and, and the tip of the iceberg, people have, have fatal infections. And the question that, we, that isn't answered yet, the jury's still out, is how does this virus 
um, fit into a pyramid like this, we don't know. Because we really don't know how many people truly have been infected and how different uh, severities are playing out. But this is a very important model. And ironically, if you have milder disease, it's easier to spread it, and it's also harder to contain it. If you have Ebola, which is much more, has a much higher case fatality, it tends to be easier to contain and it's easier to diagnose. So this is, this is an essential model as we go forward to try to better understand uh, this outbreak. And so here is how flu fits into the surveillance pyramid. And you can see that this is the annual burden of flu in the U.S. since 2010. And quite shockingly, up to 45 million Americans get infected every year. Um, as many as 800,000 are hospitalized, and up to 50, 60,000 people die each year from the flu. Why do I show this? Because flu is what we should be most concerned about in this country. More people get infected, more people get sick, and more people die. There's a vaccine. Please get your flu vaccine. It doesn't cause the flu, um, and encourage your patients to get it. Okay, this is much more concerning right now than, than, than the coronavirus. But at any rate, so this is a point of comparison. So what does this disease look like? So most people uh, believe that the range, the incubation range is somewhere between two and 14 days. We don't know for sure because we still haven't fully defined sort of the, 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 the uh, when, when this uh, infection begins. There's some people that think maybe the incubation could be a little bit longer, but that kind of gets down to uh, at what point um, does somebody have symptoms and when, do they, how, when do, are they truly first infected? The meeting is probably about five days. And the symptoms are very simple. Fever, with or without cough, with or without shortness of breath. It's, it's like the flu. It's a, it's a viral type of infection. You get muscle aches, headache. But what's interesting is they've also been seeing more nausea and, and diarrhea. And that, of course, may have been missed early on because we don't think of cold viruses as causing GI stuff. And so it may be that some of these so-called asymptomatics that may have spread coronavirus may, in fact, actually, when they look back, some of them had nausea and diarrhea. So we, we need to keep that in mind. So um, the median age is, is uh, somewhere in the 49 to 56 year uh, range. It is said to be rare in children. However, I understand there may be a publication coming out today or very soon <coughs> describing a cohort of uh, infants and, and children with uh, coronavirus. Um, why would it be less common in children? It may be in part because <laughs> adults are the people that generally frequented these, these wet food markets. Um, and it may just be taking longer to get to kids. Kids may have a little bit better innate immunity. In fact, they probably do. Um, and so they may be a little less prone to getting sick. It's not entirely clear, but there are children that do get infected. Now, interestingly, most patients who are admitted to the hospital actually do have pneumonia, um, the vast majority. And somewhere between about, um, uh, you know, uh, about a quarter to a third who are admitted develop adult respiratory distress syndrome and or have to be managed in the ICU. Um, particularly if they have comorbidities. It kind of sounds like the flu. If you already have heart disease, diabetes, you're a kidney transplant patient, and get the flu, you tend to get sicker. This is very similar in that regard. Again, all this has yet, yet to be really fully elucidated. It's going to take months of, of, of research to um, better um, um, validate these, these concepts. This is a, uh, a CT scan in somebody with uh, novel coronavirus, you can see at the top at about five days into the illness, you can see what we call gla ground glass infiltrates here, very diffuse, so the lungs should be black like they are here, out here they're not. That's pretty pretty impressive pneumonia, and this is at day, I think, 19, with significant improvement. This patient was doing much better. Um, so it, it can cause a very severe uh, pneumonia. And this is a table um, that shows the um, case fatality rates for global viruses of concern, and to start out by going down here. For influenza, the case fatality rate is less than or equal to 0.1%. The novel coronavirus, it's still unknown, but if you look at the daily tabulations, it looks like it's somewhere on the order of 2, 2.3% mortality. Um, but that's a lot less than the mortality associated with uh, SARS and MERS coronaviruses, where you're looking at about 10 to 35% mortality. So it looks like it may be higher than the flu, uh, but certainly not as high as the Spanish flu in 1918, which is over 2.5 percent, possibly as high as 20 percent. Um, and so part of the problem here is, and, and I'll go to the next slide, is that we don't truly know the denominator in our case fatality ratio. Case fatality is the number of deaths divided by the number of cases. Um, it's currently in the low 2 percent range. 
The problem is that we still don't know the total number of deaths that are denominated, and that's going to take more time. It'll have to go. The next step will be to use serology, you know, antibody testing on populations to see who actually got infected, because many people will get infected and will not be sick enough to have PCR done in their blood or on their respiratory secretions. Uh, so again, remember the, the pyramid of severity. Not everybody's sick enough to go to the hospital. Not everybody has virulence. There's probably going to be a lot of people that have very mild or asymptomatic infection. And so therefore, if anything, the mortality rate will probably go down as you increase that denominator, um, your, your ratio goes down. In addition, um, we'll learn more about how com comorbidities, such as underlying chronic diseases, uh, change the case fatality rate. And interestingly, there is regional variation in this fatality rate. In, in Wuhan and in certain cities in, in China, the case fatality rates have been as high as 8 to 10 percent. In, in other places, they're as low as 1 percent. And why is this? We don't know. There's, there's a number of theories. Um, of course, you know, China is overwhelmed with the number of cases, and it may be that people have a harder time getting critical care um, compared to places where, like in the U.S., where we have 15 cases. So it's, a, it's a really trifle compared to China, so it's easier to get them into critical care. Another interesting theory is that the severe air pollution in China <coughs> cities um, that we've known about for a long time that's been studied um, does seem to be associated with chronic lung disease. And as you get older, that may start to accumulate and may actually predispose older people to more severe consequences of these kind of viruses. So a lot of theories at this point. The good news is that we have, I hate to say it, but it's almost like a plethora of, of uh, potential antiviral drugs in the pipeline. This is great. And it's in part because we've been developing antivirals for a while for other viruses. So let me just start out with this one here. You'll see a lot about this in the news. Remdesivir is a um, novel nucleotide analog um, developed by Gilead Sciences, um, which was developed earlier for, for Ebola. Uh, and in the Ebola study, it was compared to a number of, I think, three other antivirals. And it didn't fare very well. It actually was inferior to two other antivirals. So um, that fell out of favor. But now it's, it's coming back. And it looks very promising. It has very wide, broad spectrum uh, against diverse uh, Ebola virus, um, diverse uh, RNA viruses, whether it's MERS, SARS, RSV, et cetera. So this looks very promising. This is a study here from Nature Communications that just simply shows you the uh, in vitro activity of various antivirals. You have remdesivir, you've got these HIV medications, you have interferon. Um, they all have um, impressive in vitro activity, but this is for the MERS coronavirus. This is not data for the novel coronavirus, so we, this remains to be seen, but it looks very promising. Now, remdesivir, was it, uh, go ahead. David, uh, uh, a drug near and dear to my heart and everyone in tropical medicine, uh, chloroquine seems to have been used for this as well, which is also on Yeah, so <coughs> chloroquine, uh, or, you know, an anti-malarial, an immune suppressant used for lupus, um, why would that work against a virus? Well, in fact, uh, got my little secret uh, uh, bullet here, um, it actually has very good in vitro activity against uh, this virus. It may be that it increases the uh, pH and the endosomes that merge with the virus, just as it does against the malaria parasite, there's other potential mechanisms that's being looked at. Uh, the WHO has a wonderful website, um, and one of the um, areas of the website shows you the drugs that are in development and the vaccines. There's about five vaccines that are in uh, preclinical going into humans very soon. There are dozens of other studies. They range, clinical trials ranging from traditional Chinese herbal uh, medicine to steroids for patients with uh, ARDS to antivirals. It's, it's really quite exciting. Uh, not all of them are up and going, but they're, they're in the works. So there's a lot of potential here. In addition to remdesivir, and, and I mentioned here that, that this is a clinical trial that is ongoing. I think they're about a week into the study looking at remdesivir versus uh, standard care. <coughs> HIV antiretroviral agents, interestingly, the protease inhibitors um, seem to be able to target the coronavirus proteinases. So things like the uh, uh, one of the original uh, agents used for HIV, lopinavir, ritonavir, or colitrum, seems to be quite promising. And, and, and certainly lots of uh, uh, doses of this have been donated to China to try it. Atazanavir, newer protease inhibitors, even integrase inhibitors, I don't understand why, seem to have activity. Interferon alpha um, and interferon beta and chloroquine and, and others. So 
let's then uh, wrap up with transmissibility. I think this is something that everybody's kind of nervous about. So we know quite a bit about the viruses from the other coronaviruses, such as MERS, SARS, uh, the cold-related coronaviruses. We know that they are transmitted from person to person, particularly if you're within six feet of someone else, through um, droplets. These are what we call wet droplets. Not droplet nuclei that are really tiny microscopic, but larger, you know, when you cough on somebody and, you, and, and the other person feels your, 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 the, the, the sputum uh, on them, uh, that sort of thing. And that is probably one way that it's being transmitted. However, there's a recent publication that shows that other coronaviruses can survive on fomites or inanimate surfaces for um, up to nine days, and certainly for four or five days. So it may be that this virus can live on doorknobs and countertops and things like that for, for a considerable amount of time. Um, and then the other um, you know, question here is whether or not um, this can be transmitted in asymptomatic individuals. Uh, most coronaviruses are only transmitted by symptomatic persons, so we don't know why this virus would be any different. So that leads me to the controversy here. SARS coronavirus uh, 2, can it be transmitted during the asymptomatic period? And there is this case of this young German businessman who acquired infection from his asymptomatic uh, Chinese business partner while they were at a meeting uh, in Munich. Um, this got uh, published, I believe it was in uh, New England Journal of Medicine, and it turns out that um, the authors did not actually speak to the index case. This was all secondhand information, and when they went back, she actually admitted that she was having some symptoms. Um, and so the Robert Koch Institute in Germany has actually written a letter to the New England Journal asking to set the record straight. I don't know what's going on, it's all very quiet, but at any rate, you know, take these reports with a grain of salt. Now, NIAID director Tony Fauci uh, was quoted as saying that he was, had a call with, a week or so ago with uh, uh, one of his um, uh, trusted colleagues in China who believes that there probably is a symptomatic transmission. Um, I will say that if you look at the JAMA website that I'll show you in just a minute, there's a nice podcast with Dr. Wu. He is the uh, chief epidemiologist of the China CDC. Um, he says that there are asymptomatic persons who have been PCR positive on blood, suggesting that they might be contagious, but it doesn't prove that they're contagious. It just means that they may be incubating um, the virus. So the jury is really out on this. I suspect that if there is asymptomatic transmission, it will not be um, super common. So these are my favorite websites. I encourage everybody to take a look. Dr. Blanton pointed out the a wonderful Johns Hopkins Geoinformation System, who WHO has a similar one. CDC and WHO have excellent websites that compile a lot of information. And I also like this JAMA Network website because it also has podcasts with Chinese scientists, um, Tony Fauci and others. It's great way to keep up. And finally, especially for people in the School of Public Health, um, take advantage of ProNet. This is a wonderful um, blog. Uh, it's free. You can sign up. You can get daily reports. Or you can just go and log in. It will tell you about all the outbreaks around the world. And you get you know minute-to-minute -minute information. Literally, um, there's virologists on here you know discussing um, you know drug activity and, and studies and things that are you know not even published. You know, obviously you have to take it with a grain of salt, but it's it's really really a great way to keep up with what's going on. And then finally, uh, my references, and I understand that Dr. Biden is going to post these um, in a, on the uh, website, so these will be available for your uh, perusal later on. And with that, I, I thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we uh, and uh, calling on uh, your questions about transmissibility, one way that we estimate and we uh, assess uh, transmissibility is actually by modeling these diseases. And you'll see uh, now, uh, surprising how much modeling has already happened, even though we're in the early stages of this infection, and in the future, much more information about the model. And what we'd like to have is some uh, assessment of what this all means and how we should interpret those things. So we have uh, invited uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Levy, uh, who is an associate professor at uh, the University of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, who works at the Interface of Epidemiology, Ecology, and Statistics, who has a special focus on uh, vector borne diseases and other infectious diseases. Michael.
for having me today. Uh, as Dr. Blanton mentioned, I, I study bug-borne diseases, so this is not exactly my field, but I, I do want to um, go back to a, a great uh, epidemiologist who studies bug-borne diseases. This is Ronald Ross, who discovered that malaria was transmitted by mosquitoes. And right after he discovered that, he started writing equations and trying to use math to understand why we had malaria here but not there. Why did it go away here and then reemerge here? And this is 1910, he's writing that the calculations he's using are useful not for the numerical estimate to utilize them, but because, because they give more precision to our ideas and are a guide to future investigations. And there's, as Ron also mentioned, there are a lot of models out there already on the emerging coronavirus. There's an epidemic of models on these preprint sites. And a lot of them are very good, and some of them are not good. But the numbers, the, the guesses, the predictions, that's not the thing. You know, I really don't want to focus on that, because frankly, we don't know. And if we did know, then maybe we wouldn't be modeling so much. It's very hard to predict things. These models are just to clarify your thinking. Right? They usually say it, a model is an argument, but it's an argument that you make public. And you use the math so that other people can see what you're saying and can argue against you. And more than often, the argument's with yourself. You know, what am I thinking? Does this make sense, what I'm thinking about? How I'm, how I'm assuming the assumptions I'm making? What, what am I making? You have to put them out there. And that's the key thing whenever you're looking at any of these math models. What are the assumptions? Does it make sense? The model, I also like to think of, you know, you use computers to run these models now. They're like pen keys for all your Harry Potter fans. So you're taking what you have in your brain, and you're kind of taking that thought out. And you put it in a computer so you can swirl it around and see what that thought process yields, what that, what, what you're thinking about, what it might tell you. And then a model is also like a lens. There's not one model for any virus. The model has to do with the, with the question. So sometimes you have to focus on one part of the system, some part of another part of the system. You might have a network model for this question, you might have a box and arrow model for that question. So again, they're, they're just tools to, to clarify thinking. The number one parameter that we tend to estimate infectious disease epidemiology is called the R naught. And the, the wording is very important. It's the average number of secondary cases that arise when a single typical infectious individual is introduced into an otherwise susceptible population. Average, typical, these are just back of the envelope ideas. Based on that back of the envelope idea, if R naught's above one, generally we worry. And if it's below one, generally we don't worry. So but R not, we often talk about the R naught of measles or the R naught of, of coronavirus. It's not about the virus. It's not a it's not a property of the virus. Just keep that in mind. It can change in different places. And it's not necessarily I'll get to that in a second. The, it's not necessarily the most important parameter. It's just the one we tend to have <coughs> on a lot. So the early estimates, one of the first papers that came out, had an R naught of about 2.2, which is very similar to SARS. And that's because they were taking a lot of information from SARS when they were making their estimates. Over the past week or two weeks, it's been creeping up. The estimates have been going up, and the uncertainty has also been going up. At this point, we're talking about somewhere between two and six. That's a huge range for an R. We really don't know exactly what that is, and it might not matter that much. I'll get to that in a second. There's a lot of ways to calculate R naught. One way that I find helpful is the number of contacts per time, the probability of transmission per contact, and the duration of infectiousness. So just three pieces to the R0. Again, this is the number of expected number of secondary cases you get from that first infectious case in a successful population. We talk about R. So R0 is at the very beginning of an epidemic. At the very beginning of the epidemic, no one knows there's an epidemic. Things are different. As soon as the epidemic starts, you, you start thinking about R, which is the average number of secondary cases that arise from the typical case during the epidemic. The equation's the same, but things change. The number of contacts decreases in part because people are getting infected. And once an epidemics, are, epidemics are like fire, when you start running out of wood, they slow down. And when too many people get infected, then the R goes below one, you hit the peak of the epidemic, and it goes back down. But other things happen. Um, the probability of transmission decreases. Simple things, people are doing, you know, washing hands, etc. will decrease that probability. What doesn't necessarily decrease is the duration of infections. 
And that's where a lot of the interventions we're talking about focus on decreasing how long the infectious cases are infectious. Then there's R in. So once we start doing interventions, <coughs> same thing, same equations, but now we're trying to change on these parameters, especially the time that the infectious case is infectious. You often, you often see these models called SIR models. You take the population and divide it into successful individuals, infectious individuals, and recovered individuals. That I OUS is, is in italics because it's important. It's not infected individuals, <coughs> it's infectious individuals. Then we have the rate, how quickly you go from successful to infectious, and how quickly you go from infectious to recovery. Then we can start thinking about the intervention. Isolation, we're trying to take infectious individuals and take them out of the infectious pool. Contact tracing and, and quarantining contacts. This isn't quarantining massive areas. This is finding contacts of infectious individuals and again, taking them out of the pool. When you, when, if you want to think about contact tracing, you need to modify the model a little bit, right? It's a lens. You have to start thinking about these exposed individuals separate from the susceptible pool. And as, um, you can take this type of model. This was work done for SARS. And you can calculate the R under intervention based on how quick, what proportion of the contacts you are able to identify in quarantine, and how much you can decrease the duration of infectiousness through isolation and other methods. And hopefully with the treatment, if you can treat, you're again decreasing the time that the infectious individual is infectious. Again, don't worry about the numbers so much, but this is again from a, a paper on SARS. It, it shows on the, on the y-axis is the proportion of basically how much you can shorten the duration of infectiousness. And then on the X is the proportion of the contacts you can identify in quarantine. And forget the numbers, but you, from SARS, the idea was that if you did both of these things, you'd have a, a slightly bigger impact. You had this kind of curve to, to, the, to the line there. So the idea is that if you could get our Below one through a combination of quarantine and isolation. As David mentioned, that, that might be harder than we think if there are infectious asymptomatic individuals. It's very hard, you can't isolate them. So then we have to again modify the model a little bit and include a population that is infectious and asymptomatic. Some of them may become symptomatic and then be isolatable, but some of them will just go through the course of the disease and, <coughs> and that, that makes it harder because they're going to be infectious for a long time without any ability to get them out of the pool. And there's, this is from um, Wednesday, I think. There's been some papers this week in the, in the preprints that are you know, maybe a little alarmist. This one's saying the R-naught the R value may be between 4.7 and 6.6. That's very high. That's quite high. And that if, if that's true, then quarantine and contact tracing of symptomatic individuals alone just might not be enough to get R below one. I'm not saying this is true, but notice they're talking about R naught is 4.7 and 6.6. .6. It's not R naught in this equation. It's R. What's what's the R right now at this point in the epidemic? And again, that's not the same everywhere on the planet. But the, the point of, of isolating and quarantining may or may not be enough, depending on how transmissible this thing is. And right now, we don't know exactly. It's a very wide range. So just going back to Ronald Roth's his first observation, it's not <coughs> estimates. It's not the predictions. It's just a way to try to get your head around things to ask what might work and what might not work. And these are all arguments. Everything you see in the press, take them as Take them with a grain of salt. They're, they're an argument. They're someone's ideas that they put out there. And then ask, are they focusing on a question or are they just trying to model the whole system? It's just very, it's, it's not really fruitful. So I'll, I'll end right there. We are going to hold uh, the questions till the end. Uh, right now, as best I can tell, uh, the answer is, Michael, we don't know. That is correct.
Uh, to move uh, more concretely, uh, we'd like to know what the sponsors are. And uh, we have one of our uh, faculty, uh, Lena Moses, uh, is an assistant professor in uh, the uh, uh, Department of Rural Health and uh, Community Medicine. Uh, she uh, is, uh, has an interest in uh, the control of viral zoonosis uh, because of her background as a veterinarian. Uh, she is uh, currently on loan to the WHO as part of the uh, Global uh, Outbreak Alert and Response Network. Lena? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I think we can switch to the next slide. I was asked to talk about um, WHO's response and, and, and structure in, in, in this um, COVID-19 outbreak. Um, so most of this is actually publicly available on, um, on the WHO website and you, and you can see the, the link right there, but um, essentially um, in the initial uh, assessment, risk assessment that WHO does, they build out a strategic response plan um, that, that is basically their strategy across not only the health cluster, but also security and other UN agencies, as well as external partners to make sure that um, everyone has a unified um, approach to, to responding to this epidemic. So the, the main strategic objectives for this strategic response plan, um, keep in mind, um, for example, for the Ebola outbreak in the DRC, they're on version um, 4.1 of the strategic response plan. So for every different phase of an epidemic, they, they reassess and um, re-strategize. So we're on our first one for, we're on our first SRP for um, the COVID-19 event. Um, so the, the objectives are focused on um, limiting human to human transmission, um, particularly nosocomial transmission um, with healthcare workers right now. <laughs> Um, preventing any kind of super spreading events and trying to contain um, this virus from spreading as much as possible outside of China. Um, this involves identification and isolating and caring for patients early as early as possible. As Dr. Levy um, indicated that, you know, the earlier that they can be isolated while they're infectious, um, the, the, that's the way that we change this. Um, we don't know, as far as we know, there's, there's no evidence of, of animal to human transmission outside of China. But we don't know exactly if there are reintroductions into the human population going on in China right now. Um, so identifying um, any kind of episodic that could be going on is quite critical. Um, there's a ton, because this is a new pathogen that we haven't seen in the human population before, at least hasn't been documented. There's tons of questions about clinical um, severity, clinical characterization, the extent of transmission, viral shedding, um, all of these things, treatment options. Um, there are currently um, a number of clinical trials going on in China. Um, so basically, um, there was actually a, a big research meeting here in Geneva on Tuesday and Wednesday to focus on a lot of these unknowns um, and uh, try to accelerate development of diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. Um, so you could be looking for the roadmap for research um, for this particular pathogen and disease that should be out sometime this weekend. Um, and then also effective risk communication is critical. There's a lot of really crazy information that's going on right now. Um, one thing that's very different from what was happening with SARS almost 20 years ago. Um, the other thing is to minimize social and economic impact. Um, and also um, a big critical part of that is the strain that this outbreak is happening, um, having on other essential services, particularly in China right now. Um, next slide. So this, this is what's happening at the WHO level. So keeping in mind that we have um, WHO exists in, at the country level, the regional level, so um, in the US, our regional level is Tahoe. Um, most of that activity right now is happening in the Western Pacific Regional Office. Um, and then there's headquarters here in Geneva. So this is what they're focusing on, um, epidemiological analysis and forecasting. We have modeling teams here that are looking at exactly what Dr. Lee was talking about, 
a lot of risk communication and managing the infodemic. Um, so Dr. Tedros, the Director General, is having press conferences every day to update the public as much as possible. Laboratory and diagnostics, uh, which are mostly molecular based, the serology, and whether the, the effectiveness of the serology with the coronavirus is, is still up in the air. Um, technical expertise and guidance, pandemic supply chain coordination, we have a really big, big problem with appropriate use of masks. Um, the supply chain is, is <coughs> really being tapped right now and, and health care workers on the front line are going to be at risk if, if people keep using PPE for unnecessary things. Um, travel and trade as well as port partner coordination. So next slide. So um, I'm part of this network called the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, which is about 300 institutions that provide support for WHO's health emergencies program. Um, WHO, it runs a very lean uh, program, particularly in anything that is an emergency and not planned for and funds are allocated for. And so it relies on this network to kind of provide both technical but also surge capacity in the event of, um, of epidemics. So GORN, um, one of the roles that GORN plays right now in this outbreak is, is to coordinate um, any kind of operational partners, so people who are involved in just on the ground work um, to contain the spread of this um, virus. So that includes different technical agencies, Tulane is one of them, um, any non-governmental organizations and larger international um, organizations like the Red Cross, Red Crescent. Um, and these activities are at the global, regional, and country levels, and involve surveillance epidemiology, modeling, diagnostic, clinical care, and treatment. And so GORN um, is, and I'm, I'm contributing to this, which is um, just trying to uh, herd cats and keep everything um, coordinated and communicated. Next slide. So at the, so I've given you kind of a picture of what's happening at the international and regional level, but this is what um, WHO is recommending um, be developed and built out at the country level. And so you can see here on the graph, um, if you are curious about different countries, there are already reports called the external evaluations that you can find online. They're pub publicly available, but they really give insight into different countries' capacity to and vulnerability. Um, to respond to kind of all these different health emergencies. And so the level of capacity a country has, if they're lowering capacity, the more support that they will actually, um, and the higher the risk, I should say, of, of importation and transmission, the more support, um, technical and operational support, WHO will be um, planning to give to, to them. Um, and this is in the areas of coordination. There are a lot of moving parts in this and, and coordination across all these different operational pillars is really essential. But there's also risk communication and community engagement, surveillance activities, which includes the contact tracing and case investigations, um, points of entry, entry, so screening passengers as they come in to the borders, rapid response teams to respond um, to any kind of alert. <coughs> Um, national laboratory systems, right now I think in China they're being taxed pretty heavily. Um, infection prevention and control, not just in um, healthcare settings, but also in homes. Um, case management in continuity of essential services, as well as logistics, procurement, and supply management. So the, the nuts and bolts of how a response happens. I think that might be my last slide. Yes. Yep, that's it. I would just like to emphasize uh, how important the role is that we're probably, uh, this whole thing cannot be coordinated in any other way. It needs uh, uh, an international and global coordination. And when we talk about global health and lots of uh, our departments have global health here in the school, uh, we have to recognize that we divide ourselves into nation states and there are indeed borders and be able to negotiate across all of those borders and between those different entities. The role of the WHO cannot be overemphasized. There's no other way to do this than through that organization. A little closer to home, however, is the question of uh, what uh, things are we doing here in order to uh, prepare for this. Uh, 
And what we have done is invited uh, the uh, head of the uh, uh, for Anna Bunak, the infection control at the Tulane Medical Center, to give us an idea of the preparations of uh, our medical center that probably parallels a lot of the other medical centers in town in terms of uh, their preparations for this uh, outbreak. Anna? So 
So um, one weird thing about this coronavirus is that CDC doesn't really, we don't really know how it's transmitted, right? Like we think that it's droplets um, the same way that the flu and other things are, but they've, they've given direction for us to treat it um, as an airborne bug. So that's like for things like tuberculosis, right? You wear your N95. For the flu, you don't wear an N95. So that's something that's a little weird about this. So if we were to receive a patient, we're going to be using the same rooms that we put our TB patients in, which is our um, negative pressure rooms, which if you don't know, basically means um, the room that the air filtration system in the room is taking air from outside in the hallway and bringing it in through into the room and then up through a HEPA filter so that the bad bugs coming from the person aren't going to be um, infiltrating the system. Um, and we test those yearly and we change the HEPA filters. So all of these things are, are things that the facility is doing um, on a regular basis to prepare for something like this. It's not <coughs> anything special. Um, so we also have this first point of contact uh, that's something that's in our medical record system. So whenever a patient comes into the ER, uh, that's something that we're asking every single patient. Did you travel? When's the last time you traveled? Where did you go? What kind of symptoms, symptoms do you have? And if you have any kind of symptoms that could potentially be infectious, so that's like, you know, um, I have a cough, I have a fever, I'm throwing up, any of those things, uh, we immediately know what kind of isolation that we need to put you in and who to know. So that's something that we're already doing every single day. Um, as an extra measure of preparedness, we've begun doing this in the clinics as well. Um, so they have a paper form that's kind of more based on just coronavirus and, and travel for this particular bug and the, the, the symptoms of this particular bug. So we're really screening any patient that comes into the hospital, whether it be through the ambulatory space or the inpatient emergency room space. Um, Anything that we're doing, it's all through CDC and WHO direction and direction that we take from our corporate infection prevention and emergency preparedness people. So um, we're, we're not making things up. Um, we're taking all of that direction from the <coughs> staff. Um, we've educated all of our staff. So we've, come, we've gone around, we've rounded all of the units um, in the ER, in the clinics and said, hey, have you heard about coronavirus on the news? Do you have any questions? These are the symptoms. This is what um, it means if you traveled and you have the symptoms. Call us. Don't be afraid to call us. It's not a stupid question. Um, it's just to keep you safe. So we've educated all of these people so that they should they know. We also have public signage. So that same sheet that says, um, you know, if you traveled and you have these symptoms, then let us know. That's up everywhere. So on big signs in three languages at all the public entrances and also in the clinical spaces. We are ordering additional respiratory hygiene stations that have the masks and tissues and hand sanitizer. Um, and we've also ordered additional PPE that we're keeping with our emergency preparedness stock. So if a suspect case is identified in the ED, it's going to be through our first point of contact screening, most likely. And basically what happens is they hand that patient a mask right away, a surgical mask, and they bring them to that negative pressure room that I was talking about. And they then we contact anybody who needs to know. So it'll be me, it'll be infectious disease, it'll be um, our administrators and our um, infection prevention people at corporate. And um, that's when we kind of insti start instituting the PPE that CDC has directed us to use. So that is your gown, your glove, um, a face mask that covers your whole face, and an N95 mask. So that's what we're using at Tumi. Um, a little bit of a weird thing about this virus and the directions that have been distributed is if you're wearing an N95 mask, you're throwing it out every <coughs> single time. So that's a little bit different um, than the directions that we normally get. Usually you can use an N95 mask like for the whole day with, as long as it's with the same patient. Um, so that means you're actually gonna be going through your mask more than you usually would if you had a patient on um, airborne precautions. So that's something that we're paying attention to. Um, so also in different outbreak situations like um, SARS and Ebola, 
it's been a huge problem with healthcare workers getting sick, right? And a lot of that isn't just improperly wearing the PPE, but it's actually when you take it off is when you're exposed. So that's something that all of our staff members have gone through is the training on how to don and doff their PPE and what's the correct way so that you're not exposing yourself, right? Because they found that people were basically back in Ebola taking their dirty gloves, right, that they had been touching the most amount of surface area with and putting them up by their face in order to take their PPE off, which is like not a great plan. So that's when those kinds of directions sort of changed and the order switched and so we're following the new order which all of our staff have been educated on. Um, if a patient is uh, identified in the clinic, it's pretty much the same thing except for we don't have those fancy negative pressure rooms in the clinic. So it's gonna be, give that patient a mask, you wear the proper PPE, you stick them in a room and then we assess. And all of our assessments are going through infectious disease and the health department because the health department and the CDC <coughs> are the ones that decide if the patient even meets the criteria for, for um, testing. Um, if a patient, right now, if a patient was like not in China, they're probably not going to test them. So we can isolate them, but if they say, hey, this really isn't a suspect case, then we'll stop. So diagnosis. Um, our state lab, they have the test right now. Um, but you can't use it because there's something wrong with the reagent. So we're working on getting um, a new shipment of that and then we'll hopefully be able to validate the testing and start um, using it if we do have any suspect cases here. In the meantime, all the testing goes through the CDC, um, but from the state lab. The state lab helps us make sure that all of our labeling and packaging is correct so that we don't have mess ups once we get to the CDC. Um, but all of that will be coordinated. So any patient that we get, we're calling about. Um, really, it's a group effort. We're not making any kind of decision on our own. It's all gonna be with health department and CDC guidance. Thank you.
truly critical opportunities that we have at Tulane is occurring not only throughout the entire university, but also at Tulane National Primate Research Center. Um, this center has incredibly unique capabilities and expertise to support the response to an outbreak such as this one. So in addition to that, when we start talking about the safety needs that are needed to be in place for work with something that we really don't understand how it can be a hazard to human beings, we have to have state-of-the-art containment facilities to do that in. So um, our laboratories are equipped with um, a regional biocontainment laboratory, which is one of a few handful in the country to give us the opportunity to work with this pathogen safely. Additionally, that is going to be a place where we work with it. So the RBL at Tulane National Primate Research Center is in Covington, Louisiana, and all of our team of researchers across Tulane that will be working on it will be working with it in this facility. So we are really building up the capabilities from a regulatory standpoint. So as you can imagine, with all the questions about how to handle the virus in a clinical setting, there's so many questions about how to handle it in a laboratory setting without having the understanding of how the virus can be a hazard, as I said. So what we're really truly looking to focus on is the development of the non-human primate model for the public health response, because that's gonna be a key element to ensure that we can understand how this disease is transmitting within the human population. Additionally, as we start to move down the road to test clinical therapeutics as well as vaccines as they're developed, this is going to be an incredibly important concept to have to have in place for us. So within uh, the Tulane system, within the Primate Center, we have critical experts in immunology, virology, aerobiology, understanding how this, this virus moves into the lungs of an animal will help us elucidate how it's actually moving into the body of a human being. So we have an incredible veterinary medicine capability to do this safely and do this securely as well as do this humanely. And vaccine testing can happen within this model. And keep in mind, before anything can go into a human being, it has to be tested in a non-human primate. So this is a critical step to move into the capability to really understand the disease as well as understand the medications and the prevention for it. So talking a little bit about the Regional Biocontainment Laboratory, um, this is one of the most amazing facilities that exists within the country. It has a high capacity to study large populations of non-human primates, and its sole purpose was put here is to essentially respond to crisis such as this. So in order to work through all of the understanding of this virus, we are going to be working with it in biosafety level three and animal biosafety level three. And essentially, we're doing that because we don't understand the hazard of this virus as of yet. So we're putting it at a higher containment level that has extra bells and whistles to ensure that containment is in place and that the safety factors with practices and procedures from highly trained staff is also in place. So when you are talking about a BSL-3 or an ADSL-3 laboratory, you're talking about having extensive engineering control. So just as it was discussed what it looks like in a negative pressure room, those laboratories have negative pressure capability to contain the material and the animals that are being worked with in those spaces. Additionally, everything that leaves that building is going through a HEPA filter. So that means that we can work to understand this virus in concentrations that might be hazardous and understand that it's leaving the, the building without contaminating the population outside of it. So the biocontainment will protect the people working with the virus and as well as the surrounding communities in which this uh, building exists. So we have a large scale capacity at Tulane to handle studies of non-human primates at ADSL-3, the largest in the country in fact. So this is gonna be critical for really truly understanding virus transmission, pathogenesis, antiviral testing and vaccine efficacy. People working, as I already mentioned, are extensively trained and they spend months of time learning how to actually work in these spaces and work safely. So in order to have the unknowns about this virus understood and how it affects its transmissibility and ultimately how it can be treated, this research serves a crucial role in supporting the public health response. So in addition to that, we're partners in a global community of expertise as well. And we're taking the lead to establish efforts to build consortiums where we can pull in our terrain expertise in all layers, diagnostics, treatments, preventions, immunology, to um, build a strategic formation capable of response. 
So we're also collaborating with the other, um, there are seven national primate research centers and we're working through with the other six primate centers to pull as much of the resources that are being shared amongst that community so that we can get more bang for our buck and power to the research that we're doing. So, thank you. <laughs>
what is this doing to our study abroad programs right now, this summer, and then we're looking toward the fall as well. What support resources do we have available for our employees, our scholars, and our students who may be impacted by this disease um, because they're either from the area, they know someone who's had it, um, for <coughs> many different reasons. We're looking at the guidance that comes out on an almost daily basis from State Department, CDC, and WHO. Um, we're looking at our travel abroad policies. So what about travel to China? Um, how is this impacting, again, with our study abroad, our students allowed to go? Right now, no, their programs have all been canceled. But we do want our researchers who want to go to be able to get there. We're also looking at what other universities are doing, because we are not the only ones with these same questions and issues. So we're seeing what's NYU doing, what is San Diego doing, what's Emory doing, and we're all talking to figure out how are we responding and what is this doing for all of us. And then this is just a grid. We keep a running list of all the communications we have sent or are going to send. Um, later today, an updated FAQ will be posted. So. Um, most of our communications are going out on our through email and then are being posted on our emergency website, which is tulane.edu backslash emergency. Um, so you can see the different travel policies and those iterations, the FAQs, um, and the communications that have gone out. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you. This, uh, <laughs> fairly uh, concludes this part of uh, this forum. I uh, would uh, like to thank uh, our uh, discussants and give them all a hand. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, what we hope uh, that this broad swath of uh, almost everything that we're trying to do on campus has given you at least some context within which you can put this, uh, I think uh, Lena referred to it as the inforia that should be coming out uh, over time on this virus. We are at a point where there is not necessarily even the middle, uh, let alone uh, the peak. Uh, we probably still at the very beginning of this episode. Uh, so it's important to have these kinds of discussions now. At this point, uh, we are actually done, but I think uh, the panel would be willing to stay around and answer some questions from you if, if there are any questions in the audience. I have some concerns about the recent CDC uh, guidelines because there, as you mentioned, there are multiple uh, news and papers showing that people uh, carrying virus without any symptoms and also people have no travel history to who they being tested positive. But CDC is only testing people who are um, coming back from uh, Hubei recently and have symptoms. And for the other people, um, they let them go and suggest them to have a 14 day uh, uh, time stay at home, but that's not mandatory. And I know people that don't ignore the rec recommendation still keep going to uh, public space. So um, how are we going to protect ourselves uh, in this situation? And uh, uh, is there any like uh, uh, action you're going to do to um, emphasize this issue to CDC? Because as you mentioned, there are some weird instructions from CDC. Um, we just, like a lot of clients are just thinking CDC is not doing enough. Um, thank you. Oh, one more question. How many uh, negative pressure rooms do you have uh, at uh, Tulane Medical Center, uh, UMC, and uh, VA hospital? So to answer the second question, I can't speak for UMC or VA. I can only speak for Tulane. Um, I think we have about, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15, 15 negative pressure rooms between both of our campuses. Um, but we also have air scrubbers, which are like big HEPA filters that you can wheel into a room. So if we ever had um, a lot of patients who needed negative pressure, those will actually do enough air, air exchanges and basically clean the air enough that that's, that, that would do for that purpose. Um, there are several testing recommendations, as you, as you mentioned, from CDC. Um, I don't actually know that it's necessarily true that they're only testing people if you've been to that one particular province. It actually depends 
um, where exactly you've been, what exactly are your symptoms, and they take it on a very much <coughs> like a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so that being said, we may have more of a chance to confirm cases um, rather than just send them home with directions to not go anywhere or see anybody. Um, you're right, it can be really difficult um, to instruct people to socially isolate themselves. Um, 14 days is a long time. Um, and I don't know, I think that would actually be more of a, like a health department action that they would take um, depending on the person and the severity of the outbreak should it make its way here. So. Speaking of that, uh, we have some representatives from the state health department. Uh, I don't know if they would like to comment about that question. Uh, Julie Han. Um, as a loud voice. Um, there is guidance from CDC on monitoring the movement of individuals. Um, if you're from Hubei province, you go under automatic federal quarantine at the Atlanta airport in July. Um, but we're being notified of anyone else returning to mainland China and given their positive information. So we do give them the recommendations for 14 days. The testing criteria is not limited to today. Um, there is some restriction on um, severity of symptoms for others, but the health department at this time can facilitate the can pressure CDC if we, if we truly want someone tested. Um, but we haven't come across that yet. Um, can I take more comments? Uh, it's been, uh, I have been reading uh, about Jacob saying that there are people uh, who have no symptoms showing the virus, but CDC is not testing people who have no symptoms. You want to come uh, You want to test from mainland China? The question was there are individuals who are it is, it is thought that there may be asymptomatic transmission, but the CDC is not testing people um, who don't have symptoms. And there was a media briefing I actually left to come here. Um, they did test the initial 190 something people that first came in for quarantine just to understand more about the virus. We don't test asymptomatic individuals for really anything ever. Um, and there's no reason to. Um, they did say that there is a possibility of asymptomatic transmission, but they believe that a fomite transmission is a much smaller um, role than person to person. Is, there, is that everyone heard the uh, response? Okay. I have a quick question. Is it on? It's on. target the spike, not the right, receptor. Right, but if we yeah. didn't, if yeah, we that, didn't that, target it the binds spike. sugar on the surface of some cells and a, um, a peptidase, a angiotensin peptidase. That's the two I saw. Apparently, that it's a mixture. They can, they can bind several, but that's two. And then the other question, um, the answer is no, uh, that it's not matching, that the, the S protein is not matching other coronaviruses. Um, except for this one claim now that the pangolin is carrying a virus. So if that's correct and that the pangolin is the, and they are very popular animals for game markets. If um, they are, that's the intermediate host if it, if, it, if it turns out that way, because nothing's been published yet, it's just a press release really. Uh, then you would expect to see that S gene to be close to the pangolin coronavirus. And there was a publication, um, by the middle of last year that first published a, a coronavirus uh, from the pangolin. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. But whatever it turns out to be, that one little section is going to match that intermediate animal species coronavirus. I have a question. 
Uh, yeah, one, two questions. One relates to the vaccine. You know, obviously, influenza is an RNA virus, mutates rapidly. The, you know, the antigens mutate very rapidly. Other parts of the virus are conserved. conserved. So, on, in this virus, which also mutates rapidly, is the antigen conserved or is it like influenza? I, I don't know, uh, but uh, so far everyone's infected with the same virus, 99.9% .9 the same, which points to a single source. And in fact, one study done of eight people who visited the market, um, it became infected. So it, it must have been a really hot spot for this virus. It was uh, the fact that people, one after the other, and when they're sequenced, they're, 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 uh, they have to be identical virus. But with time, so when you see the phylogenetic tree, those little branches indicate divergence, because it's actually flat. Everybody's got the same virus. But with time, there'll be divergence, and that will have to be addressed. And uh, uh, it does have a decent uh, error rate, and so you would expect some divergence, but that's a couple of years away. Yeah, the second question is for Lena Moses. I don't know if she's still on. Uh, she's probably best able to answer it. You know, one of the things that concerns me the most is a place like Indonesia which so far hasn't reported a single case, yet has direct flights from Wuhan and has basically no public health infrastructure. Uh, you know, it's hard to imagine that Indonesia doesn't have any cases. Uh, does anybody have a comment on that? In Indonesia? Yeah, North, North Korea also is <coughs> right, right. no cases. Yeah. Um, once again, we are dealing with uh, international uh, problem. Um, we actually need the cooperation of nation states in order to be able to, uh, to actually intervene and say something. Uh, it's something to be worried about, but I'm not sure what could it be done other than the, if the government will not do, is to say that they're going to ban flights from Indonesia. But they have to justify that on some basis. And right now, I don't think there's probably any basis in which they could do that. I don't know if that's what you have some comment. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Tom Binyu, a professor at Turing uh, School of Medicine. I have uh, several questions uh, to ask because this problem actually is personal to me. I have uh, some family members in China. I have three trainees uh, from Chunan that went back to China to work uh, as physicians. One of them uh, was infected. Fortunately, he's in custody recovery. So I have a first question uh, to Dr. Max about the origin of the virus. Uh, as far as I know, there are some uh, researchers in Wuhan who did a, can, some kind of recombinatory work on virus, the SARS the coronavirus and other things. So there's some rumors on the uh, social media say, hey, is this possible that this new coronavirus is a leakage from the uh, laboratory? So based on the published sequence of data, can you rule out that possibility? Uh, that's always going to surface. I mean, the anti-vaxxers and everybody else. Um, and uh, you got to look at the scenario. So they, they made this virus in the laboratory and then carried it to the market and then started spreading around the market. It just doesn't hold together. Uh, you, can't, you can't rule it out because there are people always going to believe in conspiracy. Uh, this particular one looks like a very natural event to me, based on my experience. So um, I'm willing to accept that uh, this is not a, a laboratory-created virus that was spread out. And, and that's not as easy to do as you think. I mean, you can make viruses in the lab, but you can't wep weaponize them because you don't know what the criteria are for pathogenesis and transmission. And you can go find it. it, it it's, it's a scenario that doesn't hold together. Thank you. So the first, second question goes to Dr. Neely about the uh, uh, modeling. So I know many data because I'm watching this data every day from China. If the data in China uh, are not so solid because there are cases not found or tested. So can you, based on the data from Japan, like the uh, cruise ship, the diamond uh, prints, that is a contained environment, so they have all the people contained, still contained, and they have the initial contact. So based on their published data, can you say what the R-loss should be? 
Yeah, um, I'm not so loud, so I use the mic. But some of the um, better studies estimating the R naught have been working on cases outside of China, and you can estimate the R naught from the exponential curve, and you could do that from the cases within China, or you could look at just the the kind of shadow epidemic that's occurring in in people. And I'm getting sick outside, and, and they're, they're very similar, although, like I mentioned, the R0 estimates have gone up a little bit, and that may be because some of them are now using outside data. For the cruise ship, you can estimate the R0 for the cruise ship, right? Like I said, it, the R0 in a cruise ship is going to be very different than an R0 elsewhere. Great. Thank yeah, you. I, I think uh, the point you made is uh, that you did make it. The density of the population is going to make a difference on uh, what the R naught is going to be. The uh, number of susceptibles makes a difference. The uh, uh, healthcare um, um, facility makes a difference on what R naught is going to be. So it may not be helpful in terms of estimating what it is in Wuhan. So I have a last question for a hypothetical situation. Uh, if this happened in New Orleans, can anyone here ask me how many patients can we handle? What's the facilities uh, in place, or in a short period, like two weeks, can we handle how large population if this happens in New Orleans, which with less than one million people? Thank you. That's a really hard question to answer. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it would it would really take coordination between all of the health facilities if here in New Orleans if, if we did have a. a amount of cases that one facility could not handle. Um, we would have to work on cohorting and all that good stuff. So um, without a, a specific number, I really can't answer um, that question. Um, it would also really depend on how many, how much supplies we have. So like, do we have enough PPE to um, adequately protect our healthcare workers or not? Um, if we had so many cases that we were overfilling facilities, like probably not. Um, hopefully though, we're able to contain it enough if it does get here um, with our practices that we have in place that that, that won't be a problem. Uh, thank you. Um, so I want to let you know that the National Library of Medicine and all health science libraries have a role in all things information, health science information, and emergency preparedness. Uh, at Tulane, we are a designated resource library for the region that goes from New Orleans to Lake Charles. Uh, so, you know, librarians, first of all, understand information needs of their patrons. We collect what is needed, we organize it, we curate it and we make it available. Uh, this is a difficult thing to do with something that has as many moving parts <coughs> as a pandemic. But I am a veteran of Cook County Health Department and went through uh, anthrax, SARS, West Nile, and all of those other interesting diseases. So I have a sensitivity to what the community needs and does. Uh, I want to assure you uh, if Illinois is any state um, to be regarded, that plans have been in place back to 2002 when we first received bioterrorism money from the CDC. States and local health departments have been practicing response plans. They have branches, uh, you know, the, we have the incident management system or incident response command system, whatever. So uh, you can be assured, the public, that plans have been placed. They may not have been exercised recently, but this is not new. And also to the professor's concern, we have tropical medicine graduates from our own Department of Tropical Medicine from Indonesia who are working there. Uh, one I know of is both a medical doctor and training from our Department of Tropical Medicine working in the community um, in her region of Indonesia. So we have a far reach to understand uh, people we can connect with uh, who are related to us and part of our Tulane family. But I want to let you know that I've been working very hard to create a guide that is a portal to all electronic resources as a way to organize everything that we've been talking about here. You can reach it through the School of Public Health's uh, 
website for uh, COVID. And uh, it's under resources. I'm updating it constantly. Uh, there you will find free. So the Library of Medicine and publishing partners have made available a lot of free content, which you would not get otherwise. Please share it with your colleagues. And you can find that I updated, today I updated it. Every one of those publishers had changed the information since a week ago. So that is a resource, like I said, I'm updating it. It's really important to me to know what kind of information you need. My email address is ehicks2, E-H-I-C-K-S number two, at tulane.edu. Thank you. Sam, how do you know so much about the library? I'm a librarian, thank you. I am <laughs> Elaine Hicks. I am the uh, I am the health science librarian um, that serves the School of Public Health mostly, and I have in my MPH from here and a veteran of the Cook County Department of Public Health during this very interesting time period. <laughs> Based on um, Wuhan, are there any projections? I set the question to you, Dr. Levy. Yes. I have, a, <laughs> I have some that you don't. There, there are a ton of projections, but that, like I said, it's very hard to do projections. But we need to do it. Um, yeah, we need to look at the range. So, and it's huge right now. So. It's, um, <laughs> so how many more people basically get a question? You can, you can do, there's a real simple equation with the R naught to uh, estimate these I just did a regression analysis. And I get 13% a day, two and a half times a week, 43 times a month. Let's do a regression because, you know, the, what's, what's, with infectious diseases, you know, nothing's independent. And so in the regression, you're, you're kind of assuming independence. But what, you know, the, the dynamics of it, that's why we use kind of differential equations, because it's going to change. It's held pretty good for about 30 days. Yeah, early on. It's been consistent. Yeah, early, early on. Let it walk. And so things will change. But you still need to have it to answer the questions like, how many negative pressure rooms do we have? And how much medical supplies do we have? You know, it, you, you, I mean, so there's 1,500 deaths today in Wuhan or China. If you um, back figure the number of cases, that's about 60,000 cases active. It's about 200,000 cases with active and incubated. So we need to forecast, even though it's specious. We do and we are, and there, there are plenty of forecasts. I, I'm not going to add to the <laughs> forecast. If you had three in Norris, and it followed the same trajectory as in Wuhan, in a week you'd have eight, in a month you'd have 130. But counting the incubating, you'd have 435 in just a month's time in three people, if it followed the pattern in Wuhan. Which is mean? Yeah, and with the R knots that that we're talking about, it's going to go like this. You know, that's that's what epidemics do, and I think we need to be prepared. And well, we it's don't going to increase. Be, it's going to increase exponentially at the beginning. Yes. Nobody seems to think of that. I, I think we're thinking of it. <laughs> but you know, I'm saying it's expectation. And I know that public health wants to avoid generating panic. That's always been a model that we follow. So they've always been low in their projections in, in most in most um, epidemics. These projections aren't low. I mean, it, these are not are not low, and yeah, we, we would expect it if there's an outbreak in the United States, we'd expect it to look like many other epidemics. It would be nice to have some figures. Okay. Are, there, are there any tables or databases? of like from day one forward and then projected from that. Yeah, you can get, so when you go into these 
preprints is where everything is, so you can see the models, and the good ones have their data there, and they have their code. So you can get it, you can play around with it. I was going to look at those websites and see if I can find it. Yeah. Yeah, that's Dr. Mark has uh, some comments. Yeah. As someone who's dealt with animal uh, markets and uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa for 30 years, all these countries have laws against selling these. And I know the Chinese government doesn't want to go through this again, so I'm hoping that they will enforce their own laws uh, so that these kind of things will become much rarer than they are now by just enforcing their own laws. Well, uh, with, with that, I would like to uh, thank you all for uh, coming. Hope this has been useful to you, and uh, we'll see you later.